the Class Crits Workshop on Democracy, Social Justice, and the, and the 1920 election, well, the 2020 election. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're really working on things here. Um, so this is a, a really great chance to have some early reactions to the 2020 federal elections. Um, I believe this is the third out of five workshops in a series that Class Crits has put together over the past few months to make up for missing our annual conference. Um, so thank you, first of all, for all the participants for joining on a Saturday afternoon um, to reflect on the elections. Um, I just want to make a couple of remarks and then pass it over to Tom and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is particularly interesting for me. Um, I'm just coming off of a congressional race um, on my part where I ran for Congress in Mississippi. And I think that this is an interesting juncture to kind of take a couple moments to reflect on things because while the presidential results hopefully allowed us to all kind of breathe a collective sigh of relief, we're facing challenges that are both new and historical, right? We're seeing this unprecedented unwillingness from the executive to concede to, to a clear victor. Um, and then we're also combining that with a Democratic candidate that for many was a disappointing choice and a slap in the face for American progressives. So the Democratic Party at this juncture faces internal challenges and justified critiques that are exposing this deep rift between sort of centrists and progressives who are tired of seeing the same old paths repeatedly trodden on and these ever mounting failures to account for the needs of our people. And I think this is a result of the constant drive to appeal to bipartisanship and for the Democrats to make concessions towards the center in a political landscape where the goalposts keep being moved further right and in a country where landmass has a much greater say in political representation than population size does. Um, but at the same time, and this particularly comes to mind, given that currently we're celebrating Diwali, we should remember that light triumphs over dark and good triumphs over evil and like perhaps take some hope from this. So we're going to be covering a ton of ground in today's workshop. Um, we're excited to have so many experts in different areas of the law for the format. We're going to be asking each of the panelists a question regarding their topic. They will have three to five minutes to answer. And after each panelist has responded to their question, we will open up the discussion to the attendees and panelists more broadly. So I will be a strict time monitor. So if you are speaking when you have one minute left, I will wave this at you um, to let you know that you have one minute left. So those are my remarks. Um, Tom, take it away. Okay. Uh, I think what we'll do is wait till the end of all the presentations before opening it up to uh, audience participation so that everyone will have time to make the presentation. I want to welcome everyone and uh, I particularly uh, want to thank uh, Denise Herky Jarosch from the University of Buffalo Law School because without her, uh, none of our events get off the ground at all. I'll briefly mention the other three, the next three. Uh, Classic Scripts events, one in mid-December, we're having a uh, virtual happy hour in mid-January, we're having an online junior scholarship workshop, and in mid-February, a uh, Class Crits blog symposium on racial capitalism, and we'd like you to come to those and check it all out on the Class Crits website. So I'm just going to make some brief remarks, my uh, usual polemic, and then turn it over to the uh, turn it over to our wonderful uh, panel. So what we call democracy in the United States is obviously highly imperfect, but despite the system's imperfections, the people of this society are able to exercise power in the face of its many undemocratic features. If that were not the case, Trump would not be on his way out as president, which in all likelihood he is. Nevertheless, the past four years and the near majority support Trump attained demonstrate the fragility of our imperfect democracy. A descent into authoritarian fascism is not out of the question if a cleverer demagogue than Trump should come along and convince even more Americans to follow him down that path. That's why class crits exists as a movement, because we believe in democracy and in governance by and for the people, because we see the enormous imperfections of our system of governance and the enormous injustices that still pervade our society because we desire to contribute to the building of a more nearly perfect union. That's why we're here today, to examine the causes of the fascist drift of recent years. Why so many people voted for a person like Donald Trump after witnessing his deplorable performance for four years. Why folks living in locales with higher rates of COVID-19 voted for him 
despite his gross mismanagement of the pandemic, why folks living in the poorest states voted for him, despite his attempts to undermine the Affordable Care Act and other social welfare programs. And we're here to discuss what needs to be done to counter the anti-democratic forces still at play and to move our society in a more democratic and just direction. What needs to be done to help people understand that they have been misled and that working together, we can build a society and a world order that benefits most everyone. So those are my introductory remarks and now we will move right into uh, the speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Lua Yule, who teaches at the University of Kansas School of Law. She's going to be talking about the future of democracy in light of what we've experienced for the last several years. And my lead off question to Lua is, what are your thoughts, Lua, about the impact of the past four years and of this year's election cycle on the status and long term future of democracy in America? So I'm really happy and excited to be here. Is my sound okay? A little it's, low. A, it's a little um, of an echo. Is that better or is that worse? That's okay, I will, I will hold this cool vlog mic that I had in front of me. I'm really happy to be here. I come to you from the historical, traditional, and unceded territory of the Kansas people uh, in the state of Kansas, from whom the state takes its name. And it is an awesome opportunity today to think about democracy. Um, if I had 10 minutes, I would talk about three things, liberty, power and the demos, but I've got three to five, so I'm gonna talk about the demos. Um, and what we've learned today, I believe, um, is something not new. What the last four years really gave us a chance to have a conversation about is actually uh, the extent to which democracy is anything other um, than a rhetorical value. Um, I spend most of my times not convinced that, that democracy is anything other uh, than a rhetorical value that we pursue, uh, that is a part of the identity of American, but is not actually a part of how we want to go about um, governing and how we have proven as a people over uh, more than 200 years of history uh, that we actually think governance should occur. But I, I try to be a little less jaded. And what I think we've learned over the last four years is not that we don't care about democracy, um, but that what makes the democracy or the democratic ideals that we have so fragile is that we fail to have a discussion about the types of democracy uh, that we value. And the last four years, I believe, has been a open battle that we've been fighting for the last 200 years. And that's around structural democracy, what I wanna call structural democracy versus bureaucratic democracy. In a class grid space, I think you have to get comfortable and admit that you don't want structural democracy. Everything that you're fighting against, if you are part of something that might be called the class grid movement, is structural democracy. Structural democracy allows us to, to debate who's in the demos. Structural democracy allows us to debate whether you qualify, whether a person by reason of their race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, by reason of their religion, qualifies to be a part of this thing we call the demos. We don't believe in that. I want the demos to be decided not by major majority rule, and I don't want it to be subject to election every four years. I want participation and full membership in the demos to be hard and sticky and anti-democratic. On the other hand, we're also fighting at the same time for bureaucratic democracy. I want the majority to decide how the public money is spent and resources are allocated. I want the majority to have a conversation about the best role for public schools, for public roads, for public spaces. And I think where we go in the future really gets down to admitting that that's what's on the table, admitting what the conversation is. And this election has given us a hint because while you will now hear lots of folks saying we need to take the claim that structural democracy isn't up for debate off the table, 
What you see is the successes that people who don't believe in structural democracy, but do believe in bureaucratic democracy had, really came down in many spaces to people going to the streets and making a claim that we don't want structural democracy, that democracy doesn't win in all spaces, but instead we want to fix clearly that everyone is in the demos and get down to real conversations about how governance should happen. That's what I see in the future as debate. I worry because I'm not sure we win the debate. I'm not sure that people are amenable to this, but I really think that that's where the conversation at least about democracy is going. That's my time. That's great. Our next speaker is Lucy Jewell. She teaches at the University of Tennessee College of Law. She's gonna be talking about critical rhetoric and Trump's propaganda. And my question for Lucy is, how would you characterize Trump's rhetorical approach to politics? And what do you think the long-term impact of his approach will be on the political process? Hi everyone, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Antonia. Um, so I study rhetoric and uh, from a critical vantage point. So looking at the way we think, the way we reason, and try to figure out how is power transmitted. So Trump is, his rhetoric is just, it's an, on, an onslaught of slogans, images, symbols. He is a master rhetorician. Um, so I wanted to cover four points quickly. So his rhetoric, how does it work? Um, why is it so powerful? Why did 70 million people, why do 70 million people follow Trump? Um, counter rhetoric, is it working? And then finally, shadow rhetoric. Um, there's something that we should be worried about as we enter a, a Biden presidency, which is neoliberal law and economics rhetoric that kind of exists under the surface, um, which is just as concerning as this top level rhetoric that, that Trump, Trump has given us. Um, so Trump's rhetoric is its propaganda. There's also tribalism mixed in. Um, think about football games, white nationalism, flags, trucks. So I live in Tennessee and I frequently see the big pickup trucks with the flags on the back. And that just kind of symbolizes Trump's rhetoric. Um, it's visual and visceral. He's often talking about bodies. You're bleeding, grab them. Um, he is very visual. So the color red is known psychologically to raise the blood pressure. Um, he brings up religious imagery, um, that, that thing he did where he stood in front of the church with the Bible was not, um, I mean, he knew what he was doing. Uh, racist, he taps into white pride, he's sexist, hyper-masculine, he dehumanizes any chance he gets, people of color, women, um, members of the LGBTQ community, disabled people, um, and he does it well and his followers love it. So why do his, why, why do his followers love it? Um, I think the only explanation is that Trump is mentally ill and half of this country suffers with him. Um, we know that when people are confronted with irrational messages that nonetheless still support their worldview, it feels good. There is a dopamine rush um, when they see their self-identity um, getting supported, either through Trump's words, through a meme, um, through whatever conspiracy theory is out there that is connected to Trump. Trump, um, so he's releasing dopamine um, to his followers. So this is kind of related in terms of theory to, I guess, Foucault's concept of biopolitics um, maybe a little bit of Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus. Um, we're talking about Trump as a top-down figure, populist figure, but then the social media kind of uh, functions as, you know, this just assemblage, um, creating just this power over the people, um, controlling their bodies and minds. You have dog whistles. 
Um, you also have Trump um, operating using the strict father metaphor, so harsh, punitive, disciplinarian. Um, on the other hand, there is the maternal emotions brought up, and you see this in QAnon uh, with his supporters so concerned over the children who are being trafficked. Um, so moving on, it's powerful because it get, it's embodied. It gets into the people's bodies. So counter narrative. I think the counter narrative that emerged during this era was quite successful. Um, I think Black Lives Matter, a powerful and memorable slogan, an aphorism that immediately trained the lens away from white denial. Um, it was a powerful, I mean, it existed before Trump, um, but I think it was actually a powerful narrative. Um, there's also narrative emphasizing children. There's also narrative emphasizing the visceral nature of right-wing action. Um, and visceral nature of police brutality. And that has been helpful. We have seen some crossover, some people of evangelical faith coming over and saying, you know what, Trump is not, Trump is not my president. Um, and then finally, as we move out of this era and into um, the future, we do need to be worried about what I call stealth rhetoric. So law and economics, um, we still have Americans for Prosperity, American Legislative Exchange, State Policy Network, these, these networks of money that are feeding our legislature's law, which is the epitome of, you know, rhetoric with power. And we need to be worried about that still. And those are my thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. That's great, Lucy. Uh, our next speaker is Antonia Eliason, who mentioned that she ran for Congress in Mississippi. Uh, she's at the University of Mississippi School of Law, and she ran for Congress in Mississippi this year. And so my questions for Antonia are, how important do you think a progressive shift in the South is to a successful progressive movement in the United States? And based on your experience as a candidate for Congress in Mississippi, what are your thoughts about the possibility of a progressive shift in the South? So, yeah, I, I, this, oh, okay, that sounds weird. Does it sound weird to folks or does it, is the echo okay? We're good? Okay. Um, so one of the things that, that really struck me in running is that um, ultimately I got 85,000 plus votes, um, which I lost by a fair margin, like I, my opponent got over 70% of the vote, just about. But um, with 85,000 plus votes, uh, you might think, wow, that's quite an accomplishment for the first open democratic socialist to run for major office in Mississippi. But really all it boils down to is of those generously, I'll say 20,000 of them had heard of me, the rest were just voting the D. Um, just like people just vote the R, they also just vote the D. And it actually makes no difference what you're running on, what your platform is, what your beliefs are. And I think this goes countrywide and not just to the South. But it speaks to something that, you know, we did a campaign advert as part of our campaign, which had me shooting a gun at prescription bottles, talking about the cost of health care and about the importance of universal health care and about how we need reduced prescription drug costs. The number of comments we got from when we advertised it on Facebook and YouTube, from people who said they couldn't figure out whether I was a Democrat or a Republican, because I may have talked about universal health care, but I didn't say I was a Democrat and I had a gun. And so all of this imagery went in contrast with what they thought it might be. And I think recognizing that you can have a really sound message, but the message isn't going to resonate if there's a D associated with your name. So, I mean, initially I thought my husband was being a little facetious about this, but he actually has suggested that everyone in the South run as an R and that basically like kind of do what the Democrats for a long time did in the deep South, which was run as Ds when they were actually Rs, that everyone just needs to run as a Republican. And then it brings it the onus upon the individual to try to figure out um, what the actual political views of the candidate are. But I think that one of the, I mean, undoubtedly the South is far less monolithically red than it is given to be. Um, I think some early polling data that came out from Mississippi at least said that had it been 18 to 30 year olds voting that actually Mississippi would have gone blue. 
Um, I still have to review that really. And and because there was also some statistics about had only women voted, it would have gone blue, which I find harder to believe because white women in the South, not exactly voting in progressive interests. But the idea that something needs to be done um, is I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest areas is that we have been abandoned by the Democratic National Party, right? There's absolutely no money coming in. Hundreds of millions of dollars will get spent on certain races that are viewed as potentially key and flippable, when in fact you look at some of those races and think, all that money that went to Amy McGrath, I mean, it's great that people from around the country are donating hundreds of millions of dollars, but what if some of that money was going into community organizing at the grassroots level and actually starting to build up these institutions, get people in the communities interested in their local politics? And I think that, you know, it is presumptuous to talk about winning national races when we've completely just foregone the state legislatures. And the number of questions I would get from potential constituents that were quite questions like, you know, what would you do about healthcare? What would, okay, not healthcare so much, what would you do about education? And I was like, there's things you can do federally. But ultimately, if you want better teacher pay, if you want all of these different things to happen, they have to happen at a state level. And we have been abandoned at a state level by the National Democrats. Um, the Democratic Socialists are in the middle of enough infighting in the Mid-South that it's kind of surprising to me that they can't seem to sort of get unified. But as I think in sort of um, discussing this in advance of the, the conference, I think I mentioned to Tom that this is a um, one of these situations where, you know, if you have eight progressive people, you're going to have 10 different political views. And that makes it very much harder to align because we don't have that lockstep sort of mentality that a lot of folks um, in the GOP do. So really, I think the number one thing that needs to be done is grassroots local organizing. It's about getting city councilmen. It's about getting school board people. It's about getting into the state representatives, like the state Senate, flipping those and making those changes because otherwise your Doug Joneses and your things like that are gonna be flukes. Like the only reason Doug Jones won in Alabama, you know, um, the last time around was because he was running against a literal pedophile. So at some point, you can't pat yourself on the back for accomplishments when you're making no accomplishments at the grassroots level. And that's my time. And that's what I have to say. Okay. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Run again, please. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Robert House from uh, NYU School of Law. And he's going to talk about uh, what the last four years uh, tells us about uh, international relations and I'm going to ask him a question, Rob. Uh, in light of the damage over the past four years to the United States international standing, what do you see as necessary to the U.S. as playing a positive role going forward in addressing critical international issues like climate change, COVID-19, and the establishment of a more egalitarian world order? Um, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tom and Antonia, for um, uh, inviting me to participate in this um, illuminating discussion. Um, I'll start with uh, COVID, where it seems to me that um, there's going to be an immediate uh, challenge and indeed opportunity for the incoming administration. Uh, and that goes to the question of whether the United States should uh, back um, a plan to uh, provide uh, COVID vaccines to uh, the whole world, uh, or whether uh, its focus uh, should be more um, uh, domestic and, and regional. And obviously, there is a fundamental question of, of global justice here. It's connected to um, intellectual property rights uh, as well. Uh, and it's going to be a basic choice for the administration because uh, if they want to, America can do a lot to ensure, uh, you know, that the, you know, that within a certain time frame, the whole world is vaccinated. But it it may involve um, a position somewhat at odds with uh, the position uh, even of the Obama administration on uh, on intellectual property rights, and it would probably not be a position that um, the pharmaceutical companies will like so much. On the other hand, um, 
there are lots of advantages uh, to many American economic interests in not only getting uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, through this, uh, but other countries as well, where which are American markets, where uh, you know you have crucial links in in supply chains for American uh, industry and so forth. Uh, so there's that challenge. Um, and uh, I, 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 my sense is that a lot of um, the, um, the bad blood of the last four years could be rather quickly reversed, or at least there, there could be a tremendous goodwill dividend if the administration uh, commits uh, the resources uh, of the United States to, um, uh, to vaccinating the world against COVID. So uh, I hope that that's a direction that the administration is prepared uh, uh, to think about. Um, uh, otherwise, um, related to the COVID crisis is um, a looming, if not already uh, uh, you know, uh, existing, uh, sovereign debt crisis. And um, because uh, the US Treasury, as well as the IMF have been so uh, fundamental in setting, um, you know, the background in which sovereign debt is uh, restructured and renegotiated. Uh, historically, uh, the right signals from the administration and the incoming Treasury Secretary, I think, will be actually quite important. And um, while I'm not here to say anything positive about the Trump administration, uh, I did have a quasi inside view of the Argentina debt restructuring, which lined up our Argentina against BlackRock, um, uh, uh, you know, Larry Fink. Um, and I was, I was pleased that, that Mnuchin, uh, that the administration did not particularly intervene um, to support um, uh, BlackRock or other uh, creditors that are essentially, you know, funds or, uh, you know, institutional investors who took the risk of, of buying Argentine debt or, or repurchasing or purchasing it on the secondary market with eyes completely wide open about, um, about those risks. So there's another area where I think quickly the administration uh, it can send uh, a very positive signal and it seems to me that the leadership of the IMF today also is, is quite favorable to, um, uh, you know, to uh, 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 you know, a sustainable, uh, uh, a sustainability and equity-based approach to uh, sovereign debt restructuring. So again, um, uh, a, a rapid opportunity, but also a challenge that's quite immediate given that, um, that more and more countries are gonna be facing um, uh, the, the specter of, of default uh, uh, in, the near, in, 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 a, in a relatively short uh, time frame. Uh, finally, you know, there's a range of issues uh, that we could talk about if we had more time. I'm very hopeful that on Iran, the disastrous uh, policies of the Trump administration will be quickly reversed by the Biden administration. Uh, I was looking today at an op-ed that Biden did for commentary for CNN last September, where he said that even before the U.S. really reintegrates into the deal and lifts all sanctions, at least it, it has to ensure that sanctions do not hamper uh, Iran's uh, response to the uh, COVID crisis. So I think a very early goodwill gesture would be there. And then as soon as Iran signals that it will, will come back in compliance if the US um, uh, is willing to um, uh, meet its obligations, uh, uh, that's gonna be a great opportunity to uh, consolidate one of the great foreign policy achievements of the Obama administration. I think at some point we should talk also about trade um, I really I'm gonna appreciate have to, I'm going to have to interrupt you because you're out of time. Shadow rhetoric. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rob. That was very informative. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Diane Uchimia, who's with at Creighton University School of Law. She's going to talk about uh, immigration policy. And Diane, my question for you is, in light of the disastrous and unjust immigration policies, of the Trump administration, what must the Biden administration do to restore a fair immigration system in the United States?
Can't hear you. You're muted. All right. Um, in in three to five minutes, it's, you know, just a small question in such a short time. Um, so, in order to restore a fair immigration system, uh, I mean, he ha I think he has to use every tool that he has the same way Trump used every tool that he had at his disposal. So, I think that's going to mean a combination of um, executive actions. Uh, um, regulatory reform uh you know regulatory changes uh restore you know increasing um uh increasing the number of refugees that would be allowed um uh bringing back um asylum i mean asylum the asylum system has been completely decimated mm -hmm. under this administration but i think uh, I, I mean, I, I think one of the big things, we have not had uh, comprehensive immigration reform in the United States since 1996. There have been several efforts and, um, and they have all failed, even, even under conditions that were, I think, far better than, than what we have right now. Um, so I, I think that will be really challenging. I, I think that that makes the, the Georgia Senate races extraordinarily important because, um, you know, because if if the Democrats get, uh, you know, gain that razor thin majority, then I think that that maybe there's some possibility of um, of at least some some legislative solutions for uh, immigration. Um, so, I mean, among the goals that that Biden has to bring back a fair immigration system is basically to build a, a flexible immigration system, basically one that's responsive to um, to our economy, um, to the the macro um, and micro effects of, of the economy. So while we have uh, a system of immigration, employment-based immigration, and uh, um, for both uh, permanent residents as well as uh, non-immigrant visas, um, it's still not not completely responsive and, and not responsive quickly enough to changes in our system. And then because of, uh, because of opposition to immigration, uh, you know, we've been stuck with, with uh, restricted numbers of, um, of high tech workers, uh, you know, and, and that has been uh, a problem for years. Um, we have, I, there's really so much, be, to, I mean, when you say to restore a fair immigration system, it really requires uh, an overhaul. I think uh, the challenge for Biden in, um, in bringing back a, a fair immigration system is that it is in part public perception too. So, um, uh, you know, one of our, our earlier speakers, uh, Lucy Jewell was talking about the propaganda machine that, that Trump himself is. Um, and as much as I, I dislike propaganda, I think there do need to be um, positive messages about, about immigration, about immigrants, um, to share the stories of immigrants within the community um, who have, it, not just who have succeeded, but who have been um, partners in, in communities of, of Americans, right? That, that there are, um, that there is some assimilation while there is also still this sort of maintaining um, uh, their culture. Uh, so they're adding to cultural diversity. But I think that um, that it also requires, uh, uh, you know, figuring out how to, the order in which to unwind some of the policies. So to bring back um, a fair asylum system, that that's, I think, really challenging, especially during a pandemic, because, um, because so there are the health measures, uh, the health restrictions that, that stopped immigration. Uh, there is the Remain in Mexico uh, program, which basically meant that all of the people who were applying for asylum at the border uh, were, were stuck waiting in Mexico to have their, their hearings and then could only come in uh, for those hearings. Uh, and then, uh, and then these international agreements. So basically, the the third um, safe third country 
agreements with Guatemala um, and with El Salvador when when they're clearly not safe they're not safe countries so um, so there are great challenges um, but I mean I think he has a lot of good uh, goals hey, thank you Diane uh, our next speaker is Lynn Liu uh, who teaches at CUNY School of Law and she's going to be talking about uh, economic justice and the social safety net and uh, Lynn, my question to you is, in light of the enormous and entrenched inequalities that have developed over the past several decades, and that the policies of the Trump administration, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, have exacerbated, what must be done going forward to promote economic justice in the United States? Yes, I'm not here to answer the question, what must be done, but um, <laughs> only to answer a very tiny piece of that, what can we be thinking about in these transitional, possibly transformative uh, times. Um, so interestingly, surprisingly, uh, at least one newspaper, which did endorse uh, Trump, the incumbent for, for president, um, was able to think beyond the pandemic. And their endorsement, which I am sure none of you read, because why would you? Um, <laughs> they actually endorsed President Trump because the pandemic aside, there was nothing that needed to be done pre-pandemic. Everything was going in the right direction. And as we all know from election polling and everything else, the data depends on who you ask, who's asking, what you're asking, how you phrase the question. And so as we here in the United States are fighting over what, what are the unemployment rates and what do they actually mean and what do they leave out? Do they include underemployed people? What's the poverty rate? Is that a poverty rate that includes the effects of a strong safety? the safety net that we have, not a strong safety net, but the safety net uh, supports that we have? Or is it a poverty rate that ignores the deep levels of consumer debt that individuals are, are going into? If we look to our polar opposites, our opposite in every way, geographically, virus related, and economically, in New Zealand, today they are talking about comparable worth. They are talking about how to assess wages based on comparable value of the work. We are so not there yet. <laughs> where we are is where we were around the New Deal and, and um, even that did not necessarily address all of the problems. We need to be talking about universal basic income. We need to be talking about a job guarantee. The New York Times recently reported the obituary of another amazing Ginsburg woman, a woman named Ginsburg, Helen Locks Ginsburg, who was a lifetime proponent of a job guarantee. This is not a new idea. Um, but how are we going to evaluate some of these proposals going forward? How are we going to make difficult choices? A um, couple of different axes that we, we might want to think about are um, are we going to focus on transforming or building institutions for delivery of services, those kinds of bureaucratic processes that I think Lua was talking about? How do we want to emphasize individual capacity building and support capabilities for people to change their lives on a daily and local level? Should our solutions be exclusively universally available? or should they be exclusively targeted to those who are the worst off? And how are we going to pass any of these proposals given the very deep ideological, cultural, and political divides that we have in this country, unlike in New Zealand, which is very different, to be fair. Uh, so I teach law students, and when I was in law school, my faculty always told me to use a kind of laugh test. You're supposed to evaluate whether you can sincerely and credibly um, pass the laugh test with your allegations. So when we're talking about, I'm happy to talk about universal basic income and job guarantee until the cows come home, but a lot of the pandemic related um, safety net proposals have revolved around mutual aid 
and how can we individuals take mutual aid beyond an emergency basis, right? So I have two examples for looking at some proposals and figuring out how we can evaluate them based on our last test. The first one is comedian Dave Chappelle in his Saturday Night Live monologue, where he suggested that we engage in random acts of kindness towards Black people. They're not actually random because the people who are the um, benefi beneficiaries cannot actually be deserving of the support. That was his proposal. And what um, keeps this in check for him is that he is trying to eradicate the feeling of being hated. He's not trying to hate on people. He's trying to eradicate that feeling. We do have evidence that shows that people are more willing to voluntarily give um, money to other people if they can um, actually genuinely, uh, genuinely understand what their lives are like and if they have some indication that their interve intervention will make a difference. So I think he's trying to give people hope and that passes the laugh test. But the other example that I have, and I will just touch on this briefly, is Amy Coney Barrett, who is our new Supreme Court Justice. And her colleagues submitted a letter to the Judiciary Committee in which he compared her life to a, a world of mutual support among communities and families because she's been the beneficiary of um, a covenant community. And he held her up as an inspirational example of someone who is an embodiment of human flourishing. And that just doesn't pass the laugh test for me. So I think we need to go forward and evaluate on those bases. Thank you, very good. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Rashmi Dial Chand. She teaches at uh, Northeastern University School of Law. She's gonna be uh, speaking about poverty and economic development. And Rashmi, my question is, uh, what do you see in moving from the Trump to the Biden administration as the possibilities for, entrenched, for addressing the entrenched poverty and lack of economic development that still exist in poorer communities in the United States? Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, again, a very difficult to answer this question. I think I'm going to try to treat this as part four to the comments already made by Lua, Antonia, and Lynn, um, and, and maybe draw out some themes. I'm going to start by sharing what I think are three or four basic assumptions that this is, you know, that are the foundation for the little bit of substantive commentary I might be able to make. First, I'm just going to be, you know, pragmatically oriented by saying that not much can happen, in my opinion, at the federal level on these issues unless we win the Senate, we being the Democrats, and I'm going to assume that's actually not going to happen. Um, I don't know really how much of that first assumption infuses the rest of my comments. I'll just be straightforward about that. Second, on the other hand, it is a huge step forward, in my opinion, uh, for Biden to be in a position to re-empower federal agencies who do so much behind the scenes with respect to addressing, alleviating poverty and supporting economic development, including at the local level. So simply to have competent, principled staff members who have knowledge and experience about issues relating to poverty and economic development is going to be, I think, just an, an enormous difference, a sea change in what we're going to see. Um, and I, I guess in that respect, I really buy into the kinds of analyses that Michael Lewis did in the fifth risk that, 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 eight, that federal agencies and what Trump has done to them in the last four years, you know, aside from what he's done to the federal judiciary, uh, it's just an enormous impact that he has had. And I actually do think that there is hope that even in, in, in four years, of work, but the Biden administration can reverse some of that effect, at least in, in federal agencies. One example, for example, would, would simply be for more federal agencies to use even just the supplemental poverty measure rather than just the official poverty measure in order to measure you know, the impact of various federal programs and, uh, and, the, and the needs of, of individuals and communities who are below the poverty line, again, depending on how that's measured. A third assumption is, again, it's not an assumption, it's a reality, that 70 million people voted for Trump. And finally, and relatedly, that the vote was so significantly defined along racial lines. So that, those are my four starting points. And, uh, and so the, the punchline, really, the substantive piece that I have to say on the basis of those 
starting assumptions is that I really think that the thing that has to happen, uh, whether because it will be forced, it will be the only choice uh, because of a, 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 the Senate continuing to be uh, 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 a majority Republican membership, or whether because it's the right thing at some normative level, uh, I think the thing that will have to continue to happen is um, significant continued experimentation and work at the local level, both on the development of an understanding that is more, uh, more uh, a basis of agreement, you know, a populist agreement uh, about what poverty is how it can be defined, and then secondly, of course, about how it can be addressed using uh, uh, various economic development efforts. On the, on, the, on the idea of developing an understanding of poverty, here I really am again returning to the split and vote along urban, rural, um, racial, and other lines. The, the piece that I'd like to focus on the most is the possibility uh, that revising our understanding of poverty at very local levels, using poverty and the, um, the, the need to redress poverty and inequality at the very local level could be a basis for really responding to the sort of turn towards demagoguery that I think our country has seen um, and really accepted at a meaningful level over the last four years. So that poverty could be a basis for thinking about empathy and how to restore our empathy. And I actually think that really the local community level could be the place um, at which a lot of this work could be done. And then I'm, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll say on the economic development piece, uh, and, and this is sort of a follow on to that um, potential recognition on the economic development piece, there's been a great deal of success, I think, in local communities uh, which to a, to a meaningful extent has not yet been recognized, has not yet been studied. And so before we can get to the point of thinking about something as wonderful as a universal basic income, I think we need to do that work at the local level still to think both about defining poverty and then again also about how to address it. And I'm out of time. I have to stop there. Thank you, Rashmi. Very good. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Tiffany Graham, who teaches at Toro College of Law, and she's going to be uh, talking about racial justice. Tiffany, my question is, what does the experience of the past four years say about where we now stand in the ongoing struggle for racial justice in the United States and about what is necessary to advance the effort going forward? Okay, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Um, one of the constants that typifies the way that we think about race in the United States is our affection for phrases like racial reckoning. Um, we're often in the middle of one or we're on the verge of one. And this idea of a racial reckoning is one that implies the existence of an inflection point. And you know, it's not always a useful descriptor, but I think it's a very good descriptor for you know, obviously what has been happening in the past four years. We've watched Donald Trump weaponize some of our biggest vulnerabilities on race for political ends, especially in areas like immigration and policing and the way that he discriminated against um, people who were Muslim across across the entire Muslim world and here in the United States, et cetera. So what has all of this meant for the ongoing struggle for racial justice in the United States? That's hard to say. I mean, there's a lot that's going on in that question. I only have a few minutes. There are a number of lenses that we can use in order to try to figure that out. But I think that one place we have to evaluate is the existence and the role and the likely persistence of white identity politics. But more than that, something that was unexpected from this election was the non-white alliance with this kind of politicking. So of course, when we're talking about white identity politics, we're referring to white people who have a psychological attachment to their identity as white and who experience a feeling of solidarity with other white people because they perceive themselves as having common interests, in particular interests that are under attack. 
attack by a society that is changing, a society whose forms of hierarchy are no longer prioritizing them in quite the same way that they are used to understanding. Scholars have been talking about the emergence of this form of politics for the past several years, but I think it's something that deserves a lot more attention. Now, Donald Trump took advantage of the instincts that a lot of people who identify in this way by appealing to them. He appealed to people with the white identity politics who are explicitly racist, the Klan, the Nazis, etc. But there are plenty of people who have a form of white identity politics who do not, who, who do not demonstrate the classic markers of racial bigotry in the way that we understand them. Nonetheless, because they believe in acting in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that reflects solidarity, they would still ultimately be supportive of structures and barriers that fence people of color out. So it's something that's you know, important to understand the dynamics and the consequences of it. But in any event, understanding white identity politics and understanding how they function in our society is not simply about understanding how um, these particular groups of white people are going to behave in an electoral setting. It's also about understanding what complicating factors exist there. Number one, you have um, data from uh, this most recent election, which show that 18% of black men supported Donald Trump. 32% of Latinos supported Donald Trump as well, which was up from 28% in 2016. When you look at you know, one particular example, what happens in Miami-Dade County, um, Latino support for the Democratic Party simply collapsed. There are specific reasons regarding messaging and socialism that help explain why that happened, but nonetheless, it still did. But then you have, of course, the flip side, noting that Biden improved the Democratic Party's performance with white men, um, both college-educated white men and white men without college degrees. So in any event, what does all of this suggest? I mean, I think there are several things that are at stake here. Number one, I think it highlights the different understandings of racism that exist between elites and the grassroots. And people of color who are part of the grassroots did not necessarily share the view of racism, of him as a racist, that many of us do. Second, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's something to be said about the cross-racial appeal, both to authoritarianism and economic populism, ideas which were manifest in the way that Donald Trump conducted himself and, 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 and ran his operation. And with that, I'll stop, but I do think that we need to pay a great deal of attention to economic populism in particular, because that is going to be an idea and a theory that's going to animate Republicans in particular in the future. And I'm out of time. Thank you, Tiffany, very good. Uh, our next speaker is Diane Fry, who teaches at San Francisco State University is going to be talking about worker rights. And Diane, I want to ask you, in light of the historic centrality of organized labor to helping advance a progressive agenda, what does the last four years and this election cycle tell us about the possibility of strengthening workers' rights and revitalizing the union movement? Thank you. Uh, I think the, to answer that in the short version of the last four years, I think organized labor and organized workers groups in general have demonstrated incredible grit, courage, discipline in a longstanding struggle that dates basically from the rise of neoliberalism. And there's also, I think, great hope that a Biden victory would come along with a congressional victory and it would bring transformative change to kind of re-embed unions in a stronger legal and institutional framework. And indeed, unions work very hard on elections around the country. And as a result, in terms of the presidential election, over 57% of people who earned under 50,000 a year voted for Biden, and under 56% uh, of people earning under $100,000 a year voted for Biden. And the good news is that that's the majority, and the bad news is that it's not a, a larger majority. And there are, I think, a lot of reasons why organized labor was really hopeful. Biden actually is more pro-union than Trump. Um, and that his uh, campaign had really far-reaching uh, 
agenda in terms of labor reform, not, not as far ranging as Harvard's with the clean slate for workers program with European style sectoral bargaining and broadening rights to strike, et cetera, and employee representation on corporate boards, but certainly a very ambitious agenda put forward by Biden in consultation with many unions around the country. And so there was a lot of hope as particularly based on the polls that this was gonna be possible. And just in the few conversations that I've had with folks since the election, I think the, the result is sobering and has called for a real reassessment. And so looking at the three paths that people were hopeful Biden would be able to, to work along to increase the capacity of unions to be able to represent workers and working people. I think the legislative one, as other speakers have said, is basically at least on hold for the next two years. But that still leaves really meaningful paths for Biden to pursue in terms of, and, and unions expect that Trump's executive orders will be reversed. And in some, I think unions expect that at the end of the Biden administration, they will at least be back to the Obama administration with regard to things like procurement. Uh, um, and so if companies aren't obeying and complying with federal safety laws, uh, paying wages or engaging in wage theft, they're not going to be getting contracts. And also executive orders to make it easier for low wage workers like home care workers to organize. So I think executive orders are potentially important, although I think we now have an added element for additional challenges through the courts, given the change in the makeup of the courts. And as Rashmi was talking about, I really liked your, uh, your vision of empowering federal agencies. And I think that's also potentially meaningful for, for labor because there's so much that can be done in terms of enforcing uh, wage theft uh, and mislabeling, mislabeling employees as independent contractors. All of the, the administrative parts of the National Labor Relations Board, including hopefully maneuvering to get rid of a Trump appointee as general counsel, are all going to be a part, I think, of what Biden is going to be pursuing. And most symbolic of that, I think, is the commitment that Biden has made to have uh, a working group made, a cabinet level working group made up of labor leaders to help strategize, prioritize, and work on these issues. So I would say in conclusion, I think, as others have said, widespread legislative reform is just not possible. And Biden will use executive orders. And the question is, how much will they be challenged? I think unions and Biden, well, unions recognize, especially in the reappraisal, that they're really fighting authoritarianism itself. And I think we have to look at authoritarianism within workplaces as well as in society and democracy. That it's not just political, it's in the sphere of work. Anti-union ideology is legitimized in really surprising places full of liberals like universities where people talk about mission-driven agendas, which just really allow people to kind of roll over other people without having a voice or transparency. So I think hopefully we're gonna work on that as well to try to, to, to try to bring democracy to workplaces and at least to build, to continue to emphasize that as we, as we move forward through the next four years. Thanks. Thank you, Diane, very interesting. Uh, our final speaker, and then we'll turn to audience participation is Nicholas Stump from Western University College of Law, who's gonna be talking about the environment. And Nick, I wanted to ask you, in light of the efforts of the Trump administration to dismantle our environmental laws and scuttle international efforts to address global warming, what steps must the Biden administration take to restore a sane and effective environmental policy? So thank you so much for the question, Tom, and for the other organizers who invited me to be a part of this uh, workshop this afternoon. I have so enjoyed uh, everyone else's comments. So I'll have both a short answer and then a slightly uh, longer answer to this question. So my short answer is that it is heartening that the incoming Biden administration has to date outlined relatively progressive uh, environmental and energy action. Uh, for instance, just this week, they released a uh, climate 
uh, plan per se as part of their uh, transition materials on their website, where they generally discussed such policy goals as recommitting the U.S. to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, catalyzing development of the U.S. clean energy infrastructure, uh, including right accompanying clean uh, energy jobs in their uh, union uh, context in particular. And they also discussed achieving uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Of course, the IPCC um, set the benchmark uh, at 2030, really to, to avert uh, catastrophic climate change, but 2050 uh, is better than nothing, right? And also the Biden uh, administration or the incoming Biden administration discussed environmental justice in the context of their energy and environmental policy goals, which are, of course involves issues uh, of the environment as intersecting with uh, race, indigenous status, gender, class, and so forth. So generally speaking, uh, compared to basically the utter uh, environmental dystopia uh, of the Trump administration, I do think that these are uh, positive uh, steps in a very general sense. So my slightly longer answer, however, is that in my work, uh, both scholarship and, and uh, broader work, I approach environmental issues and issues involving the broader ecological political economy from a uh, fairly deep leftist perspective, right? Primarily uh, rely on eco-socialism and also in an intertwined materialist Marxist uh, eco-feminism, right? And, and through these uh, uh, deep leftist um, environmental approaches, of course, the, the ultimate goal is not uh, environmental law reform, uh, but rather the systemic reformations of the ecological political economy uh, beyond uh, liberal capitalism in its entirety, right? So I think for me, right, and for other deep uh, environmental legal uh, lefties, I do think that we are you know, rightly skeptical that the Biden administration or the incoming Biden administration's uh, relatively centrist actions will intersect uh, or reflect, right, with, 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 such, uh, with such deep left uh, transformations. For instance, the climate change plan that they, uh, again, released on their uh, transition website this week uh, does discuss sustainable growth, right, so continued uh, perpetual economic growth, right, uh, uh, continued ceaseless uh, capital, uh, accumulation all within the context of, of liberal capitalism. Also, the uh, uh, Biden campaign sort of famously um, refused to uh, come out against fracking, right, uh, during their uh, campaign. And, and they have uh, likewise, um, of course, uh, not committed to immediately ending fossil fuel use. So, right, so from the sort of uh, deep uh, left um, environmental legal perspective, we're could we perhaps uh, go from here under uh, the incoming Biden administration? So in, in the first place, we can rely on and support those bottom-up grassroots movements, such as uh, the climate justice movement uh, and so forth, right, that are trying to push the uh, Biden administration to the furthest left uh, as is possible, like perhaps a um, progressive uh, Green New Deal in the very least, right? Right, right now, their um, uh, climate plan, for instance, sort of represents an implicit light uh, version uh, of at least some Green New Deal policies. But beyond that, uh, as my closing remarks, um, I do think that we're ultimately going to have to rely on uh, even more radical grassroots movements, right, in the United States um, as uh, connected internationally, um, right, from a law and political economy perspective, we're going to have to support them through theory and through practice, such as through radical cause lawyering modes, to again actually move beyond any such environmental reformist approaches to true uh, transformative change. Uh, again, uh, beyond liberal capitalism, which, for instance, could involve an eco-socialist and eco-feminist eco steep Green New Deal, right, which again is conceived um, entirely beyond the liberal capitalist, capitalist paradigm. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, all the presentations were, were wonderful. And so now we'll move into our Q&A with the audience.